Today I'm going to do a video all about the terminology used in perfumery. So that's the words that are used to describe various things in making perfume, things like accords, absolutes, what do all of these words mean? If you watch some of my other videos and you're confused sometimes when I say something, this video is probably going to help clear up exactly what I mean when I say some of the terms that are used in perfumery. If you've already got a good background in perfumery or the perfume industry, this video is probably not going to help you so much, but if you're completely new to this subject, and especially if you want to avoid confusion from common terms, things like bases and base notes, which sound the same, but are in fact completely different, then definitely this video will help clear up some of those misconceptions. Okay, so firstly, I'm going to talk about the terminology used to describe different smells. So the first one that comes up quite a lot is notes. So people will say, a perfume has certain notes in it, or there are certain smelling notes. Now, a note in perfumery is basically the distinctive kind of smell which you perceive. So, say you smell a perfume and you could smell inside it, mm, and that's got some rose in it and it's got some musk. You could say that perfume has notes of rose and notes of musk. Now, say on the other hand you had a raw material. Let's take ginger essential oil as an example. When you smell ginger essential oil, you can smell ginger, but you can also smell some lemony aspects to it. So in that case, you could actually say the ginger essential oil has notes of both ginger and lemon, even though there's not actually lemon inside it, it's just ginger, it's just that it has this lemony note to it. This is also similar to in coffee or wine tasting. So in coffee, for example, you could say the coffee has notes of caramel or notes of chocolate. It doesn't mean that there's actually caramel or chocolate in the coffee, it just means you perceive a chocolatey or a caramel note and therefore you can say it's got that note in it. Again, when they're selling perfumes in shops, they will often list notes and what they're doing when they list notes in the perfume is say, hey, we think that you should be able to perceive this X, Y and Z in the perfume. So it doesn't actually mean when perfumes have smelling notes that that thing is necessarily in the perfume. For example, a perfume may have smelling notes of rose and jasmine but the perfume itself may not actually contain any real rose or jasmine. They may have synthetic accords, which are designed to smell like rose and jasmine. It's still perfectly valid to say the perfume has a rose note or a jasmine note inside it. However, it wouldn't be valid to say the perfume actually has rose or actually has jasmine inside it unless it actually did have rose or jasmine inside it. So it's a very subtle distinction but it is something um, to note and it's something that's used to great effect by the marketing teams to make you think sometimes that something's got something in it when it doesn't. Anyway, next after notes we have chords. Now chords are quite similar to notes but they're not the same thing. So if you think about it, you could think of notes as from the point of view as the consumer or when you're experiencing a smell. Chords on the other hand are much more from the point of view of the perfumer. Now again, chords are pretty much these distinctive notes um, but more specifically with a chord, it's about the combination of raw materials that you're getting to produce that note. So from the point of view of a perfumer, yes, having a note is something, but until you know how to actually produce that note, it's not very useful to you. And an chord in perfumery is effectively the knowledge of how to produce a certain note. It's what combination of raw materials work together to give a distinctive uh, kind of smell. So you could look at an analogy to music for accords being a bit like chords. In music, you have certain musical notes which you can combine together in a certain way to produce a chord, and a chord has a distinctive character. However, despite that distinctive character of the chord, it can be used in different combinations with other chords to make a different song each time, even though the same chord's being used. Now, in a perfume, you have multiple smelling notes, or multiple raw materials, and these can be combined together in a certain way to make an accord. And the accord has a certain character, and that's really what's defining the accord here, the character of the combination of things. And then that accord can now be used in different perfumes, in different contexts, to give a different uh, composition overall. But it's that accord, that character, that's being reused in these different ways. Okay, so now we're already on the subject of accords and notes, we might as well discuss bases as well. So bases are very similar to accords, but the difference between an accord and a base is that a base has a well-defined exact formula to it. So while for an accord you may be able to create the same accord with slightly different raw materials or slightly different quantities of those raw materials to give the same overall effect, 
and they could still be classed as the same accord. With a base, it has to be exactly the same raw materials and exactly the same quantities. So you can imagine that there may be two different ways of making, say, a rose accord with different raw materials. Some of the raw materials could be the same, but others could be different, and the quantities and the formula could be slightly different. You would still say they're both rose accords because they both smell like rose. However, the exact smell of those would be different, and the actual formula entries going in to create those accords would be different. And therefore, if you counted those as bases, there would be two different bases. So a base is essentially an exact formula which you could write down and reproduce and have that on your shelf of raw materials. So think of the accord as a bit more conceptual and the base as a bit more um, exact, a bit more precise, a bit more material. So bases, uh, you can make your own bases, of course, by making your accords into set formulas which you remake again and again. Or you could just go and buy bases that are pre-made from fragrance companies this can be especially useful in the case that they have certain captive molecules. A captive molecule, by the way, is a molecule that they've got the kind of copyright of, something that only they're allowed to produce because they made it with their own uh, scientists. Sometimes they may have some of these captive molecules and they may put these in their bases. So if you want to use that captive molecule or that smell that you may not be able to find anywhere else, you kind of have to go with one of their bases in order to actually use that in your own perfumes. While we're still on the topic of bases, I just want to make the distinction quickly between a base and a base note. So a base note is actually completely different from a base. A base note is just the term to describe something that lasts a long time. There's actually three of these kind of notes. There's top notes, middle notes, and base notes. And all these are, are very loose terms to describe how long a certain raw material or an accord or a perfume lasts. So a top note lasts a short amount of time, something from a few minutes to an hour or so. A mid note lasts a reasonable amount of time, but not ages. So something probably that lasts in the realm of a few hours. And then a base note is anything that lasts a very long time. So anything that lasts for quite a lot of hours or even into the days, weeks or months. Those things are classified as base notes. So in this context, you can imagine that you could have a base which you made but that doesn't define if it's a top, mid, or a base note. You could have a base which is made of base notes, and therefore your base would also be a base note because it lasts a long time. But you could also make a base out of top notes. So for example, you could make a citrus base out of lime, orange, and lemon, which are all top notes. And therefore the base which you've made, or that predetermined formula which you've made, will also only last a short amount of time because all of the things in it last a short amount of time. In that case, you've made a base, which is a top note and not a base note as such. Hopefully that clears things up a little bit. Okay, so now we've covered terminology relating to the smells and perfumery. Now we're gonna start talking about terminology related to what actually goes inside the perfumes. Now, probably the most important term that you'll hear a lot is the term raw materials. So raw materials is basically all of the ingredients, you could say, that go inside the perfume. If you're new to perfumery, you might naturally call them ingredients, but basically just know that the proper term used in perfumery is raw materials. Now, when you're making your perfume, the first step you do is mix together all of these raw materials. And once you've mixed together all of your raw materials, what you call that is a fragrance concentrate. So the fragrance concentrate is effectively the pure form of your perfume. When you've got your fragrance concentrate, what you do next is you dilute it down with a solvent. So the solvent is basically what you put into your fragrance concentrate to make it into the final perfume. Now, the reason that the term solvent is useful is because that is what you use in chemistry when you say you want to dilute something down. And the reason that we say solvent in general is because sometimes you might use a different solvent depending on what you're doing. So if you're making a candle or a soap, for example, you may use a hot wax as a solvent to dissolve your fragrance concentrate. Normally, however, most of the time we're using alcohol or ethanol in our perfume to make it a normal kind of perfume that you would spray on. So what is ethanol, you may ask? Well, ethanol is the term that's used in chemistry for the type of alcohol that you find in alcoholic drinks, for example. So the kind of alcohol you'd find in vodka, that's called ethanol. But ethanol is the term for the pure form of that type of alcohol. Though People often call ethanol alcohol as well, so these terms can be used quite interchangeably. 
Now, another term you may hear used quite frequently in this context is perfume as alcohol. What perfume as alcohol is, is essentially almost pure ethanol, but it's just got a few other additives added into it. So most of the reason for this is to make it legal in order to sell it or to buy it without a license. However, some people can claim that these little additives could help with the perfume as well. But either way, when you're making your perfumes, what you want to use basically is either pure ethanol or perfume as alcohol if you can't get hold of the ethanol. These terms can basically be used interchangeably. Just know that there is a slight difference between them. Okay, so next let's dive a little bit deeper into the raw materials and understand the terminology associated with those. So the first term you may sometimes hear is a concrete. What a concrete basically is, is when you have the fresh raw plant material and you go and you solvent extract that with a solvent, but this solvent is not water or alcohol, it's usually a chemical solvent, so things like toluene, and basically what happens is that extracts all of the waxes and the volatile fragrance ingredients out of that raw plant material, usually to make this kind of thick, sticky mass. Now, concretes themselves aren't usually used in perfumery in their raw form, but what happens is you use a concrete quite often to make something called an absolute. So an absolute is basically when you take a concrete you've extracted and then you extract the concrete with hot alcohol. So this is the same ethanol that we talked about earlier. And what that does is it pulls all of the alcohol soluble fragrance uh, materials out of the concrete while leaving the things like the waxes inside, which you don't want in your perfume because they don't dissolve anyway. Next, we have something that a lot more people may be familiar with, and that is essential oils. So essential oils are when you take the plant mass and you boil it off and then you collect the vapors and out of those vapors you extract the oil which is usually quite a fragrant oil and that is what's used as a raw material in perfumery. Next after essential oils we have something that probably a few less people know what are and these are balsams. So these are kind of exudations from the plant so things like saps and resins which have been collected off the plant. So for example labdanum has this thick sticky liquid which is used to create the raw material that's a basalm. Same thing for things like frankincense. Now, these basalms aren't usually used directly in perfumery either. What usually happens is they're first made into a resinoid, which you can use in perfumery. So a resinoid is again, a bit like the case with the concrete, where you take hot alcohol and you extract the basalm in this case with the hot ethanol. And then what you get after that is the resinoid, which is a good raw material to use in perfumery. Finally, for the raw materials, another term I think is worth explaining is the term musk. And this is because in traditional perfumery, musk referred to an animal product for a raw material. But in modern perfumery, it's a little bit different. In modern perfumery, musk actually refers to a wider category of synthetic raw materials. And these raw materials, some of them resemble that original animalic musk a little bit but usually musks are the base notes that are in the perfume and often they're associated with things like laundry liquid. And this is because a lot of musks are used in laundry liquid because they stick to the clothes when they're being washed rather than just getting washed out like other fragrance ingredients might do. Anyway, finally, I'm gonna talk about a few other terms which don't really fit into the categories I discussed before, but they are things which may be important to note nonetheless. One term is headspace. Now, headspace is a form of analysis essentially used to capture the smells from living things while they're in situ. So this is really used for plants or things like flowers uh, when you want to capture the smell of the live flower. Now, this basically captures uh, some molecules of the flower in a way that can later be analyzed by a lab. A lab can then use this information to make a base which smells of that flower which can then be used as a raw material in making perfumes to provide the notes or the scents of that flower. This is especially important in the case of delicate flowers which can't be extracted by extraction techniques such as distillation, where you have to boil the flower and that might actually destroy the scent in the process. So this headspace analysis is something that the big fragrance companies use to make bases of things that are otherwise impossible to obtain just naturally by extracting them. Another set of terms that is frequently used in perfumery is eau de cologne, eau de toilette, eau de parfum, and parfum. 
These are basically designations which are given to a final perfume depending on the concentration of the raw materials or how strong the final perfume smells. So the boundaries for these are a bit fuzzy, but basically if your perfume had a final uh, concentration of the fragrance concentrate in the solvent of about 2 to 4 percent, then you'd probably call it an eau de cologne. If on the other hand that concentration was closer to 10 percent, you would then call it an eau de toilette. If further still, you increase the concentration, made it something like 20 percent, you could then call your perfume an eau de parfum. And finally, if you made your perfume stronger than something like 25 percent, you can start to call it a parfum or an extrait de parfum. And all this really means is how strong it is. It's just something that's helpful in the marketing when you're selling your perfume for customers to understand how strong the product is. This is why sometimes you may find a perfume with two different prices for the same size in the shop. You may have an eau de toilette and an eau de parfum version, meaning that the eau de parfum, because it's got a higher fragrance concentrate, is slightly more expensive, but it may be a bit stronger. It may project a bit more and it may last a bit longer. Projection as well as another term used in perfumery. Projection just means how far that, when you put your perfume on, how far away can you smell it from? Finally, another term which is frequently used in perfumery is the term maceration. Now, maceration is basically the process by which your perfume kind of settles after you've made it. So it's basically when all the chemical reactions that are happening, if any, which may slightly change the composition of your final perfume, these will occur maybe in the days or weeks after you've made your perfume and the scent, because of that, what you actually smell may change a little bit as well. Sometimes it gets better, sometimes it gets worse. It's a bit like aging a wine in a barrel. It can slowly change with age and the same thing for cheese as well. So when you macerate your perfume, you're just leaving it for the, the aromas to kind of meld together and change if they're going to change, which they may or may not. Now, because the reactions that happen in maceration are so complex, there's so many potential things which may react with one another, it's impossible to say beforehand how a maceration is going to proceed. All you can really do as a perfumer is, once you've made your formula you're happy with, leave it and see how it progresses over time and see how it develops. If you're lucky, it will get better. If it gets worse, then you may have to bin it and rethink with a different formula to make your perfume. Anyway, that's all the terms I'm going to cover in this video. If there's anything you think I left out, please do just put it in the comments and I'll try to reply with what it means. Hopefully this did help out some people. I am aware that maybe some people already understood what these terms meant, but I do think that this is useful for someone who maybe hasn't heard any of these terms before and wants to know what they mean. Anyway, thank you for watching the video. Please do consider giving it a like and subscribing to the channel. Also, let me know in the comments what other videos you would like me to make. This video itself was a suggestion from a comment, so I do definitely look at these and use that to help think what videos I'm going to make next. Anyway, that's it from me, so thanks for watching, see you next time.